What's up, church? You guys are nice. Good to be here. How's everybody feeling this morning? So good to be here with all for one super region. Not one, not two, not three, but four churches in one today. Amen. So good to have the Santa Barbara Church with us today. The Ventura Church. We got the Wild Wild West. And of course, our gracious host, Southland. Amen. We got a whole army of disciples here this morning. Man, I looked around. We got the army brigade here this morning. We got some baptisms today. Uh, we got, uh, I mean, I don't know, the demons are upset today. If I was the devil, I'd be heading out any door, any vent, any air duct, anything. I'd be exiting out any window I could if I was the devil. Amen. I'm so inspired to be here as we head into the last two months of this incredible 2022. What a blessing it is to be here with such great men and women of faith. Sad me, sad me, mon fleur. My lovely and talented co-leader, nobly leading the women's ministry for not one, but 10 churches, the Decapolis. Thank you so much, Sadvi, for all you do for us. Rico and Janelle Jones, <laughs> soon to be going and leading our church in one of those islands. Uh, Polynesia, I don't even know. I can't find that on a globe. But Paul and Kim Hammond, I know Kim's not uh, feeling well today, but our amazing congregational shepherds for us. Son's filling in for him. Ethan's over there for us. Amazing shepherds of the flock. Paul and Kim have over 60 years of combined experience taking care of God's people. Amen. We got Ashton and Cara Hughes in the house. Taking care of that planting over there in Santa Barbara. What a sacrifice to go plant a church in Santa Barbara. Amen. We got, uh, of course, Tyree and J.L. Ellison, Southlands leaders in the house, soon to be taking their talents to no cow. And of course, Michael and Jasmine Peterson. What? Michael and Jasmine popping in to see, say hi. He's probably, uh, he's probably uh, editing me, you know. He's got his bullhorn over there, his uh, clipboard, his uh, red ink pen. I don't know. He just didn't sound very fired up to me. I don't know. Uh, I can't recognize everybody this morning, but it is certainly great to be part of so many precious heroes in the faith here this morning. But I'm so thankful for all of you. Go ahead and open your Bibles up to Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13. We've got a bit of work to do this morning. It, it is such a critical time, exciting time in our church, yet critical. And a high level of responsibility falls on us. As we go through a time of missions and transitions, I like to call them transmissions. Missions and transmissions and transitions. With three of the four church leader couples departing, a new crop of leaders soon to arrive, I think a tone must be set. And that brings us to Matthew chapter 13, where we begin reading in verse 24. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat. And he went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, don't, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then? Did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you were pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first, collect the weeds, tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring them into my barn. I love this passage. If I had a lesson title, I would call it Timing is Everything. Timing is Everything. Let's go to work. Let's get to work, folks. The best things in life take time. Maybe it's that I'm getting older. My birthday, my 57th birthday is here in a, just a few days. I will send out, I will send out reminders <laughs> when I was younger, I was impatient. 
because I thought that dreams would come true quickly. But the best things in life take time. Uh, even in the simple things, things like food, things like parenting, marriage, spirituality, there are no shortcuts. The best, best things in life take time. People who don't have time to cook don't cook well. Because the best things in life take time. There are simply things that you learn from struggling. There are things that you learn from longevity, from tests to trials and especially to errors. Some of my best teachers were failure. It takes time to do well. It takes even longer time to be well because there really are no shortcuts. I want you to listen to the words of King Solomon, one of the wisest men that ever lived in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. In, in verse 1 he says, there is a time for everything. Who believes that? There's a time for everything. He says, and a season for every activity under heaven. An older version of the Bible says, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. Now we all know that we got purpose, but do we understand season and do we understand time? Some people are seasonal. Some relationships are seasonal. Some opportunities are season, seasonal. And yet as we see seasons change, we think the blessings have ceased. But it's not that the blessings have ceased, it's just the seasons have changed. I got a lot of trees and bushes in my yard. And uh, there's a big difference between how my yard looks in the spring and how my yard looks in the fall. By the time it gets to winter, the trees and the bushes are ugly. They are ugly. They are bare. They are destitute. If you saw them in the winter, you would have no idea of how beautiful they can be in the spring. When they start blossoming, it takes time. Verse 2, there is a time to be born and a time to die. One thing I know, a truth in life is the, the funeral homes and the mortuaries today are full. At the same time, so are the delivery rooms and so are the nurseries. There's a time to live and a time to die. The last time I was on this very stage was March 1st, 2015, when I got married to April Diaz. Right in this very room. There's a time to be born and there's a time to die. A time to plant and a time to to uproot, a time to plant and a time to uproot. I, I think about in your life, do you know the difference between the time to plant and the time to uproot? Many of us have asked God when to plant, but have we asked God when is it time to uproot? There, are you just intent on keeping that which is planted to the destruction of uprooting what you have been accustomed to? You can't have a new season in your life if, until you're unwilling and until you become willing to say goodbye to the previous season you just had. I call that the art of letting go. The art of just letting it go. The spirit of release, not wrestling, but releasing. Some of you are wrestling to hold on to something that God is trying to take away from you. And you're holding on for dear life. Some of you need to release it and simply let it go. That was for last season. When I was a child, I thought like a child. I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. But when I became a man, I had to let go of childish things, of childish thinking, of childish reasoning. I thought as a child. I spoke as a child. I reasoned. I understood as a child. If you're still talking the way you talked 10 years ago, I got some bad news for you. You have a deformity. You have a spiritual dysfunction that keeps you locked in one dimension. That means you cannot fall in love with your thoughts because you'll stay in one dimension. All the stubborn people here this morning say, amen. amen. All right, okay, well, I'm not sure. Because if you're stubborn in your thoughts, you can actually delay your next season. You know, the greatest people in industry, the greatest people uh, in all different types of industries that leave the greatest impact understand timing. Timing is something we got to fight to understand. Timing is everything. Can you say that with me? Timing is? Everything. Timing is? Everything. You know, part of baking, I am a baker after all. Yeah, I got to go there. But part of baking is timing. 
There are a lot of people that cook but do not bake. Because there is an art to baking, and it's called timing. There is a difference between a dry cake and a moist cake. Are you with me? Now, you can tell I'm getting hungry. The hungrier I get, the more food analogies that I use. Come on, you, come on, Miguel, you got me. Whenever you eat a dry cake, you know it's been left in the oven way too long. All right? Baseball. We just had the Houston Astros just won the World Series. Amen. But baseball is all about timing. It's a huge thing. We think it's about skill. It's about timing. It's timing that causes the batter to be effective when he swings the bat. You can have the right swing. You can work on your swing all you want, but if, the, if you swing at the wrong time, you're not going to make contact. Come on, Ashton knows what I'm talking about. So you can have the right swing, but you can be swinging at the wrong, okay, the wrong time. And so some of us are in such a hurry that you're swinging the bat before it's ever going to hit the target because you are sometimes moved by the crowd and not by the ball. Timing is everything. And not only is timing everything in baseball and cooking, timing is everything when it comes to comedy, to public speaking, even, I think, to music. It's all about timing. You can tell a good joke, but can you time the joke? <laughs> you, you, can, you, you, you can't just read music. You can't just sing, but can you keep time? You can preach a message, but if your timing is all off to convey the information, you can literally convey the right information, but at the wrong time, and you can be an incompetent speaker because you don't understand timing. You guys with me? Yeah. Everything has a rhythm. God has a rhythm. Breathing has a rhythm. Circumstances, circulation, heartbeat, pulse is a rhythm. Everything that is alive has a rhythm. Uh, birth has a rhythm. A woman's body has a rhythm. God is telling us repeatedly in nature, in creation, and creation that timing is everything. You cannot be fruitful out of season. You can't do it. So we got to know what our season is. Some of us, we got to ask God to help us with our timing. Help me with my timing. You can be right about what you said, but you can be wrong about when you said it. I know some of you know that. You can do more damage than you did good. It's not about right and wrong. It's about timing. Right information delivered at the wrong time can tear a marriage apart. Right information delivered at the wrong time can cause a child to feel defeated, can stop a loan from going through, can stop a house from being built. It can stop you from having the peace that you ought to have, saying the wrong things at the wrong time. You're worried about being right, but what you should be worried about is timing. Sorry, I got a little cold right now. I hope I don't sound too croaky. Holding on for dear life to this water. Thank you, Donnie. I want to talk about food for a second. I'm uh, hungry, man. <laughs> Harlan Sanders. Let's talk about old Harlan Sanders there. I know some of you guys know he is. He built an amazing business because he did the right thing at the right time. It's interesting. Uh, I was doing some research. The first Kentucky Fried Chicken opened up in 1952 in Salt Lake City, Utah. Mm, come on. Come on, Utah. And he was 62 years old. Colonel Sanders, 62 years old, KFC came at the right time in American history when women had just started going to work. And it came at a time when families were still sitting around the dinner table having dinner. It solved the problem. How can we simulate a family dinner when the wife's not even home to cook it? I was raised by a single mom, and sometimes we was po. You know what I'm talking about. Some of you know what I'm talking about when you po. Po is when you're poor, but you can't afford the OR. And my single mom was trying. We were so poor, we used to go to KFC and lick other people's fingers. Listen, it's the Annie Istamans talking. It's the Annie Istamans. What, what? Doing the right thing at the right time. Time. That's what I'm talking about here. It wasn't just about the chicken was great. It was about the timing. 
was great. The need was great. It solved the problem and it came at just the right time. If Colonel Sanders opened up a KFC right now, it'd go bankrupt. I know it'd go bankrupt. Where's Paco at? I know Paco's in the house. Paco knows what I'm talking about. Now, it's interesting. I did some research on that. In September of 1970, Colonel Sanders and his wife both got baptized in the Jordan River. That's another sermon. But listen, if you opened up a KFC right now, they're going to want to know, is it gluten-free? Is, is this vegan chicken? Is this trans fat oil? Is this free range chicken? Have you ever been to a boneless chicken farm? It's abysmal. See, they, they weren't asking those questions at the time that Colonel Sanders came around. They weren't asking the questions. Success is just as much about timing as it is anything else. Do you know what time it is in your life? You're like, why is he preaching this? Well, do you know what time it is in your life? I got a watch on my wrist. I got a laptop that tells me what time it is. I got a phone that tells me what time it is. Even if it's daylight savings time and I wake up an extra hour early so that I can spend an extra time with the Lord. But I got all this equipment. I got to know always what time of day it is, but do I know what time it is in my life? Do I know what time it is in my life? Is it time for me to put away childish things? Hmm. I can only be fruitful in my season. The very first Psalm, the very first one, describes a person that is like a tree, which yields its fruit in season, <laughs> and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. Building Fruit that is in season. You got to know when your season is. You got to know sometimes when it's your season and when your season is over. Yeah. Hmm. You got to know when to hold them. You got to know when to fold them. You got to know when to walk away. <laughs> Sorry, man. I sat in Dayquil talking, but, but you got to know when to fold them and you can't see folding them as failure because it's all about Amen. Let's get back to the text. Matthew 13, the text, the text. It starts with a common phrase that's kind of bugged me. Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like. Huh. Ten times Jesus uses this phrase in just Matthew's gospel. In fact, seven times he uses it in this very chapter 13. And it's interesting that he says is like. Why, why don't just tell me what the kingdom is? Why do you got to tell me what it's like? I want to know what it is. Jesus doesn't tell us what the kingdom is. He tells us what it's like. And so he's teaching kingdom truths that are cloaked, that are veiled in comparisons. Jesus has decided to teach us about the kingdom in comparisons so that you cannot be inundated by the comparisons that you fail to look beneath the soil of the text and to extract the truth. The truth is hidden in the fabric of the story. The revelation is hidden in the analogy. So why is Jesus telling us this story that causes you not just to read this scripture, but to think? Sometimes we got to read the Bible and think the Bible. If you don't think when you read, you will not retain what you have heard. I think I heard that somewhere. Some will hear my message today and get nothing out of what I say because they will not add the, necess the, the, the necessary thinking to what I have said. And let me tell you, if you don't think, then I am not your preacher. Because I can't preach to people who don't think. God is not hiding the truth from us, however. As, as a master rabbi, Jesus is trying to explain the unexplainable to a far less intelligent being. The kingdom of heaven is like. That even made it to our flyer. 
like a first grade teacher teaching a, a small student what it is like to be in Scotland or to be in other parts of the world. She has to consider the age, consider the intellectual development of the student in order to be effective at what she is teaching. She's not hiding it. She is literally bringing it down and reducing it down to the level of the audience she is talking to. That is what Jesus is doing here. He says the kingdom of heaven is like, and that is God stooping down. That is God bringing himself down and coming to our level as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Isaiah 55 verse 9, I think I read that somewhere. God is saying, if, if I taught you at my level, you would never understand it. And so I am going to speak to you in metaphors, in similes, in comparisons, so that you can learn what the kingdom is like. I'm going to have to find something that we can compare it to. Hmm. He says, what I'm talking about is so high. J Jesus always talked about the kingdom. He said, what I'm talking about, it, it's so high that I'm going to break it down in the very first line, just for you, when I say the kingdom of heaven is like. In other words, I'm just talking baby talk here. baby. <laughs> Oh, that's what God's doing with us. He's baby talking us. Amen. He's talking to us. He's breaking it down for the truth so that we can all get it. Amen. I am going to teach you some things from this text that stuck out at me, things that stuck out in this text that I think are important. And then I am going to sit down. Here is my question as we kind of keep on rolling, as we dig deeper in this scripture. What in my life needs to be better timed? I took my shower this morning according to what time it was. I got dressed this morning according to what time it was. I, I have to keep track of time I, I, because if I lost track of time, I would always be late. And if I'm late, I lose. That's just the way life is because timing is everything. Okay. You guys are with me there. I nobody's sleeping back there, right? This is why I never want to be late for church. I never want to be late for church. If I miss the first song today, if I miss that first song, if I miss those first lyrics and the singing, when the singer started singing and, and God's spirit just started filling the room and the Lord just started blessing us and everybody just started singing and dancing in the aisles and clapping, moving from side to side. If you miss that, you miss the very building blocks of the platform of which I'm standing on right now. I never want to miss worship. I never want to be stumbling in late. If you don't respect time, if you don't respect my time, the church's time, your job's time, your friend's time, people's time, you will never be successful. You will never be wealthy. You will never be mighty and you will never be noble. Only poor people inwardly and outwardly care nothing about time. Verse 25. While everyone was sleeping, the enemy came and sowed seeds among the wheat and went away. See, the enemy comes in while they were sleeping and he plants weeds. Now, it's interesting when you think about it, that they don't wake up the next morning and realize that the enemy has even been there. The enemy has slipped in. And they don't even know he's been there because the enemy has planted in such a way that when they wake up in the morning, they don't notice any change. Something happened. They don't notice it. Something changed. And while they did not notice it, the weeds were sown into the wheat. My first point, it is naive to think that the planting of good exempts us from the presence of bad. Just because something good is planted doesn't mean that we're exempt from the bad. The kingdom is like this. Just because, God, but just because God allows wheat to be planted doesn't mean that the weeds are somehow restricted. What does that mean? It means that we have to learn how to produce in the weeds. You ever try to produce in the weeds? We have to produce in the weeds. So all you folks out there who are waiting for the weeds to be gone before you can produce wheat, you are not digging deeper into this text. You follow me? Because this text declares there will never be a day 
that you can be wheatful and not weedful. You with me? See what I did there? I don't know. I'm just having myself. That's the Benadryl. That's the Benadryl talking. Just hang in there with me, guys. I only got about another hour. God, God, God allows the wheat to be planted, but that doesn't mean that the weeds are restricted. Wheat is planted deliberately. In other words, wheat is not going to grow if it's not planted. That means that wheat is not the natural result of the climate, of the sun, of the soil, of the rain, of the sunshine. Wheat has to be planted. (laughs) Nobody succeeds accidentally. Nobody accidentally slips and gets a master's degree. Nobody accidentally wins the Olympics. Nobody accidentally wins world records or, or that beautiful Vince Lombardi trophy. Just saying. For some of you who've held it before. Nobody has ever accidentally won a marathon. You ever seen that happen? Nobody's accidentally got a degree. Nobody's accidentally passed their GED. It's not going to happen. And nobody accidentally is going to make it to heaven either. I guess you could play that out. Nobody's accidentally going to go to hell. Just because you pray doesn't mean you win. Because this is work. It's work. And some preachers don't want to tell you that. But it's work. This is sweat. This is labor. This is deliberate agriculture. Agriculture means there's an intention of sowing seed is so that I might have wheat. Now stay with me. And the intention of me having wheat is so that I might have bread. From seed to wheat to bread. And that means it's going to take time. It's going to take time. There are no shortcuts. I cannot plant seed today and have bread tonight. Because timing is everything. So if I'm going to be seedful, I have to be patient while the seeds grow. First down... And then up. You, somebody caught it. Somebody caught it, right? It's interesting because a seed first has to grow down and then up. Some of you are looking, looking at your life talking about, I don't see nothing. I've been sowing, but I don't see nothing coming up. Nothing's coming up because seeds got to first grow down before they come up. You're not supposed to see it right away. It's got to grow down, and just because you ain't seeing it don't mean it's not happening. You with me, church? This ain't, this ain't quiet church. Quiet church is down the block. Just because you don't see it don't mean the roots are not growing down in the soil. And if you would just wait a little bit, if you would just wait a second, it is going to go from seed to, to, oh, come on. Give yourselves a hand. You guys have got it. Okay. And and, and here's what you got to understand is there is work to be done at every stage. There is work to be done in the plowing stage. There is work to be done in the planting seed. Planting seed is work. Harvesting is work. But let me tell you, when you harvest that seed, that is not going to feed you. Making bread is work. Take it from a baker. Making bread is work. It's work, 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 and work. You cannot eat any better than you work. Consider this. Your blessings from God is work. Thank you, Jesus. We got work to do. To break some sweat. You're going to have to put forth some effort. You're going to have to put in some sweat equity. You're going to have to grind the wheat. You're going to have to grind the wheat. You're going to have to smash the wheat. You're going to have to pulverize the wheat. You can't just bring in wheat and make bread. It ain't going to happen. You got to crush it. Some things got to be crushed. It's got to be made into a usable form. 
before I can eat. So it, it, some of you are like, well, God has not blessed me with bread. Mo, maybe it's not that you haven't put in the work to get the bread to go from the seed to the, to the, okay, amen, all right. I don't know, in the fellowship, you might, I, don't, I just don't know if I'm ready for consumption right now. Let me tell you. Just say, well, I'm in the process. Hmm. I'm going somewhere, so, so don't look at me now because, because I'm not bred yet because I might be in the seed stage. I might be in the wheat stage. I might be on my way to the place, but when I get there, God has destined some plan for me. Can I get an amen from somebody in here? I'm in the process. I'm fine with that. God says, just hang in there. I'm not finished with you yet. You're in the process. I'm taking you through a process, and that's going to be good. And at just the right time, God is going to take you from seed to to amen. Wheat has to be planted. I like that because it is not indigenous to the land. It's interesting the word agriculture is rooted in the word cult. He said it. He said it. I knew it. Cult means you're not orthodox. You're not normal. You're not natural. Agra means land. Hmm. That means that wheat is not normal to the land. In other words, you can't just wish for it and, and, and think it's going to happen to you. You can't wish for it. you got to make it happen. Make it happen. you got to agriculture it. You with me? i got to make this happen. It is not indigenous. You don't get it just because you want it. It doesn't work that way. You got to plant it. You got to be intentional about it. You got to work on it. You got to labor for it because you're not raised in an environment that agrees with your dream. Think about it. You, you, this is not, no, the, the environment you grew up in is not agreeing with your dream. That doesn't mean you can't have it. That just means you got to go and be cultural about it enough. Are you cultural enough? I'm the only one in my family. I'm the only one in my neighborhood. I'm the only one in my city, and they don't like me at my family reunion, and they don't invite me back to the parties, and they don't like me. My friends have changed because I am cultish to them. I broke the rule, and I got out. Is anybody else in there with me today that got out? You got cultish? Faith is a cult to an unbeliever. They just can't think like it. it is not natural. Faith is not natural to an unbeliever. Stop trying to make the people at work think and understand what they cannot understand. It's faith. It is not indigenous for them to have faith and to believe. If our gospel is hidden, <laughs> it is hidden to those who are lost. Second Corinthians four, verse three, they can't see it. It's not indigenous to them. It's cultish. But you got to be willing to be different. You got to be willing to be controversial. You got to be willing to be talked about. The greatest problem in our church right now is that we are so sensitive. We are so sensitive to what others think. We're more worried about being liked than we are about being fruitful. We just want to be liked and, and you're praying to God. You're like, God, what he said and what they said, what she said. And yet God said, anyone who comes to me and does not hate his father, his mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, cat, dog, even your own life cannot be my disciple. I read that somewhere. Did you read that? I was right there, right there in red letters. Such a person cannot be my disciple. So what they said about me don't matter. Weeds will never like wheat. So you got to decide, am I going to be wheat or am I going to be weeds? Point number two. This one's a little tricky. Whenever there is great potential for harvest, the enemy will always earmark the spot with trouble. Wherever there's great potential for harvest, the enemy will always earmark it with trouble. Let me explain. A friend of mine told me the other day, 
I was hungry. And we were talking about German food. <laughs> what time is it? <laughs> and, um, and he was telling me about this German restaurant that I want to try. So I pulled out my phone, my Galaxy S22 Ultra. That's the reason it came home with Daddy, Ultra. I found it on my phone, and I earmarked it as favorite. Now, I hadn't been there yet, but I earmarked it as a favorite so that I could find it easily. I hadn't been there yet, but I heard there was potential. So I earmarked it so that I could find it when I had time. You with me? Yeah. Where's my preachers this morning? I already, I already know where I'm going with this one. Whenever your enemy sees your potential, he will always earmark it with trouble. And he will always earmark it with misfortune. They never planted weeds before they planted wheat. If you notice this, notice the sequence here. It was the wheat that was being planted that caused the enemy to plant the weeds. Think about that. They didn't plant the weeds and then plant the wheat. No, the wheat attracts the weeds so that the enemy can earmark the spot. Your enemy, the devil, knew that God was going to bless you. He knew that your life was going to mean something. He knew that God was going to use you. He knew that God had a purpose for your life. So Satan earmarked you with troubles. And that might explain something. The weeds are planted too, like, like enemies hidden behind enemy lines or, or spies hidden behind enemy lines. Whatever misfortunes happened in your life or maybe happened in your past, whatever trauma you went through in your childhood was the enemy's way of earmarking the spot. Satan knew that it wasn't time yet, but he started working underground before you ever came up. So that literally he would have his system in place before you became fruitful. He had his infrastructure in place before so that you would always have something to struggle with. Why are things so hard? Why do I not get it? Why do I always seem to take two steps forward and then take three steps back? Why is it so hard for me to grasp stuff that's so easily for other people? It's because Satan has earmarked you. Satan has got you in his sights. Why am I so doubtful? Why am I so insecure? Why am I such a knucklehead? Why am I so needy? Why am I so petty? It's because Satan has earmarked you. While the men slept, the enemy came and planted weeds. Wherever there was wheat, there would be weeds planted intentionally. See, the weeds were also planted intentionally. Satan meant for you to be abused. Satan meant for you to be molested. Satan meant for your daddy not to like you. Satan meant for your mom to give you to your grandmother. Satan had to start building you into his infrastructure early. Because once you sprung up, it would be too late to do anything to you. So he had to start early in your life so that you would be broken in all the right places. You're not just fighting Satan. You're not just fighting a demon. You are fighting a system. You are fighting a system that has been launched against you. But the only reason that it's been launched against you is because you are wheat and you have been planted. And Satan doesn't like it. And he's coming after you. The enemy seeks to corrupt the environment. Stay with me for a few minutes. Satan has, has really made it his goal to corrupt the environment wherever God has seed in the ground. The saboteur is slithering in the garden. And that shouldn't shock us. That's the first time we read about, about him. And when we first meet him in Genesis, where is, what is he doing? He is slithering in the garden. And guess what, guys? He is still slithering in the garden. Whatever God has put, whenever and wherever God is planting something, your enemy is always there slithering. The snake is stealthy. It's cunning. He waits until they're asleep because he knows that timing is 
everything. I mean, it, it, what would have happened if he'd come when they were awake? They did just shoot him off. They just ran him out. They'd driven him away. So while man sleeps, Satan slithers. He waited till nobody was looking. He waited until nobody was home. He waited until you were place, in a place of vulnerability. He waited until you were in a place of desperation. He waited until your rent was backed up. He waited until you were hurting. He waited until there was a death. He waited until you, there was a crisis. He waited until you were a child. He waited until you were in a jam. He waited until you went to summer camp. He waited until you went to school. He waited because our enemy understands that timing is everything. So while men slept, he came planting in the dark, sowing in the soil. I don't get to see him plant it. We don't get to see him plant it. We don't even get to see what it is that he planted because he is covered in darkness of night and his craftiness is hidden under the soil. So they wake up the next morning and they don't even see a difference. Have you ever had something happen in your life and nobody else even sees the difference? But you know something's happened. Here comes my rooting system. When the men wake up the next morning, they don't know. <laughs> and so while they're watering the wheat, they're also watering the weeds. <laughs> and the infrastructure, the system has now become a system that is underground that we can't even see before the wheat ever comes up. Before the wedding, before you were called, before you got the degree, because you're now fighting a system, not just Satan, but a system that is, you're fighting an infrastructure of tangled up roots. And remember, this is what the kingdom is like. These roots, these wheat and weeds underground, there's a war going underground. The tangle is underground and we can't even see it. You're trying to fight on top of the soil. But where's it happening? Underground. The system is underground. You're trying to fight in the flesh, but the system is being fought in the spiritual world. Number three, corruption and destruction are two different things. Corruption and destruction are two different things. You guys still with me out there? I promise I'm coming in for a landing somewhere. Satan couldn't destroy the wheat. All he could do was corrupt the environment in which the wheat was growing. Hmm. In other words, he couldn't stop you from coming up. He just wanted to make it hard for you. Satan cannot kill your destiny. Satan cannot kill your future. Satan cannot kill what God has in store for you. Satan cannot kill what was ordered, what God ordained. Satan cannot curse what God has already blessed. So since corruption and destruction are not the same thing, Satan couldn't destroy my blessings, so he wanted to corrupt my environment. And that's what he's doing here. So he begins working underground, working in the root system. See, Satan also believes in seeds. Satan believes in seeds. You cannot reap what you do not sow. If you sow sparingly, you shall reap sparingly. You will know a tree by the fruit it bears. If you put nothing in, you get nothing out. There's always going to be seed time, and there's always going to be harvest time. Everything comes by seed. Grass comes by seed. Trees come by seed. Apples come by seed. Watermelon come. You come by seed. <laughs> Jesus is the seed of Abraham. God understands seed. Satan knew that if he was going to enter your area, he would have to do it by planting seeds. See, Satan knows. He knows what you doubt. He knows that you're still trying to have success without sacrifice. And the twisting of, of roots and all this infrastructure, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. The men didn't even know what the weeds were. They didn't even know they were there until the wheat sprung up and the weeds came to. And the men just quickly asked, 
Where'd these weeds come from? And, and sometimes we hate the weeds, don't we? You know what weeds I'm talking about, right? Yeah. We hate weeds. We get frustrated with weeds, all these weeds. All this noise, all these problems, all these issues. A system has been put in place. We know what the system is. We know who planted it, but we don't know from the text why Satan planted it. We don't know why he planted it. And that's a really important question to understand this whole thing. If you don't understand why Satan planted weeds, you can't figure out how to overcome it. I'm coming in for a landing. My, third, my first thought was maybe, maybe the weeds kill the wheat. But it doesn't say that, right? The wheat and the weeds can grow up right beside each other. Everything's fine. If it was wheat when it went into the ground, guess what it's going to be when it comes up out of the ground? It's still going to be wheat. If it was weed going into the ground, guess what's going to come up? It's still going to be weed. <laughs> wheat, weeds. So if the weeds didn't kill the wheat, why did he plant it? Because the kingdom of heaven is like this. If he can't curse what God's blessed, if he can't change the molecular structure of the good stuff that goes in of what he planted in me, if he can't change my wheat into weed, hmm, why did he go out at night and slither around and put the weed beside the wheat? The temptation comes with the decision how you're going to handle weeds. How do you handle weeds? And this is where we're going to close out at. How do you handle weeds in your life? What's your first reaction? What is your instinct? Get rid of them. Pull them up. The whole mystery of where did these weeds come from? The master says, an enemy did this. And what was their reaction? Hey, you want us to go and rip them up? We'll, we'll, we'll go rip them up right now. We'll rip them up. No! Leave it alone. See, the master knew that there was a system underground that even if you pulled up all the weeds, you would eventually destroy the wheat too. And that's what we want to do. We want to pull up all the weeds and if you pull up the weeds, you kill the wheat too. The whole mystery. Satan is trying to get me to take matters into my own hands. He's trying to get me to do things that is not my job to do. He's trying to get me to solve the problem. And yet the Bible says, leave it alone. Sometimes you got to leave it alone. You're uncomfortable, but leave it alone. I don't like this, but leave it alone. You're frustrated. Leave it alone. You're aggravated. You're tired. You're frustrated, but leave it alone. That's the setup. Satan wants you to do something. He wants you to take it in your own hands. But God says you got to have enough faith to leave it alone. Sometimes you got situations in your life, you just got to be still and know that God is God. I call that the power of doing nothing. The faith of just being still. Sometimes it takes more faith to do nothing than it ever does to do something. So if the enemy can't curse you, he will try to get you to curse yourself. Sometimes the smartest thing you can do is nothing. And that might fly in the face of maybe the way you view Christianity. Be still and know I am God. If God said it's wheat, it's still going to be wheat. Do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The enemies you see before you today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. Because the battle is yours. The battle belongs to God. Satan's trying to trick you into cursing yourself. And so he's built an infrastructure underground. So that when you grab the weeds, when you grab the weeds and try to pull it up, you're going to destroy the wheat too. Hmm. The wisdom in the waiting is the trick to wait it out. Amen. Weeds cannot change wheat. So why did Satan plant it? To trick you into impatience. To try to make you feel like you're running out of time. To make you feel like you got to do something now. Sometimes your faith is expressed through your silence not by taking matters into your own hand. Sometimes you just got to leave it alone. Timing is everything. 
Right now, we're in a critical time in our church. There's a lot of movement going on, a lot of people coming, a lot of people going, a lot of shifting. But God says, no matter what happens, no matter all the variables in life, I'm still here. I'm still the constant. All the variables, I'm still the constant. And it's not that you're wrong. It's that the timing isn't right. You can pull the wheat before it's harvested, but then you'll ruin the whole harvest. And that's the seduction of your frustration with the weeds. You cannot rush the harvest just because the planter gets impatient. This may be our finest hour. The way this church lands as we begin the year of miracles, 2023 in January, may just be just how we handle this situation right here with all the shifting, with all the moving, all the un, uneasiness and who's leaving, who's coming. I don't know. I don't know. I like that guy. He's loud. He makes noise. I don't, who's he? Where'd she go? I don't know. I'm a, I want you to pass the test. Timing is everything. Let God let you be wheat. Let's win this test. Let's make sure that we give it all to God and to God be all the glory. Amen.